You can't keep on doing the same thing forever, and whilst every video game franchise should try to maintain and keep a hold on those all-important roots of what made it such a success in the first place, reinvention is sometimes key, and where better to test the waters of an idea than in a spin-off. After all, spin-offs only count when they're good, we all know that. When they're bad, we can all do our best to forget about them and move on with our lives, unless they're particularly awful, in which case we can point at them as an example of what not to do ever again. I'm CypherWhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video game spin-offs that insulted the fans. Number 10. Castlevania Judgment There are plenty of franchises that could perhaps benefit from a fighting game that pits its vast array of characters together. In all fairness, it's not like Castlevania doesn't fit that bill, with its lore taking place over hundreds of years. Judgment as a concept should have been a nice surprise that brought familiar faces and locations together. In practice though, the game was a hot mess of terrible decisions. Whilst Castlevania had changed art style over time, Judgment's take on the series just wasn't the right fit, and many classic characters were poorly represented. When it came to the gameplay, the Nintendo though Wii's motion controls meant that the fighting itself was imprecise and aggravating, which got even worse with the camera whipping around wildly. Koji Igarashi himself, a figurehead of the series and a producer on the title, even admitted that the controls were difficult to do when you're waving something around. Motion controls in a fighting game just aren't worth the trouble, and they wounded any promise the game had mechanically. The salt in that wound was how everything Judgment got right about Castlevania, such as including sub-weapons and a host of kick-ass music, it got twice as many things wrong. What should have been a celebration of the series' wide gothic cast and history instead was a huge sales failure and a black mark on the franchise. Number 9. Link's Crossbow Training When Nintendo released the Wii, it was bundled with Wii Sports, which was the perfect representation for what some of the Wii Remote could do. However, the company wasn't totally satisfied and kept continually trying to show the unlimited potential of the new era of motion controls. In order to sell families on the white piece of plastic that was the Wii Zapper, Nintendo released a truly bizarre Zelda spin off. Entitled simply Link's Crossbow Training, this arcade-style shooter uses a lot of Twilight Princess assets and clocks in with a campaign length of about one hour, which makes it feel more like a tech demo than a full game. And that would be fine if it wasn't attached to one of the company's most treasured IPs. Ignoring the fact that Link has never wielded a crossbow before, the game might be worthy of a bit of fun if it lasted more than your lunch break. Rather than show the depth of the Wii Zapper, which is clearly what Nintendo designed it for, it more just proved that its use was very limited. Run around a bit, aim, shoot, repeat until you get the general idea. Forget about a grand adventure with this one, you're more likely to have the realisation that the Wii Zapper was an entirely unnecessary lump of plastic. Number 8. Final Fantasy VII Dirge of Cerberus For a long time, Final Fantasy games tended to be standalone stories. Final Fantasy VII, admittedly way after its original release, changed that with a string of additional material that explored its world after fans repeatedly expressed interest to see more. However, the first side game in the compilation of Final Fantasy VII made many regret that original hope. A spin-off should absolutely mix things up, but how Square Enix ventured so far from the JRPG style of Final Fantasy for Dirge of Cerberus is enough to make your head spin. One of the all-time greats of the role-playing genre and its sequel is a third-person action shooter with arcade elements? Well, the problem isn't necessarily the departure of style so much that Square had never done this sort of thing before. As such, Dirge of Cerberus' gameplay was lacklustre at best. Its linear, chapter-based progression hardly allowed it to grow the FF7 universe, which was the entire reason fans had desired a spin-off in the first place. Vincent Valentine, Final Fantasy VII's equivalent to notorious edgelord Shadow the Hedgehog, takes centre stage in a story that never really gets off the ground. Instead, Dirge Dirge is by name and by nature lost in the mammoth shadow of the original's legacy. Number 7. Animal Crossing – Amiibo Festival Animal Crossing New Horizons is one of the best-selling games for the Nintendo Switch, having moved close to 40 million copies of its relaxing social sim goodness. What started as an obscure Japanese-only IP has blossomed into one of Nintendo's most recognisable properties. With City Folk on the Wii and New Leaf on the 3DS, the series' popularity had begun to grow, and fans waited patiently for the Wii U instalment. However, rather than the next mainline title, Animal Crossing became the focus of perhaps the most vapid attempt at selling plastic crap. 
back. Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival is a board game style spin-off title that has all the charm and warmth of the series on its surface, but underneath is worryingly more insidious. The game heavily relies on players having as many Amiibo figures and cards as possible. Different game modes are locked behind specific figure purchases, meaning that the supposedly optional peripherals outright gate off content from a title that was sold at a full $60 at launch. Worst of all, even after buying all the necessary models, Amiibo Festival is just boring. There's nothing much to do. Animal Crossing in general is not a series about skill, so this game relies instead on blind luck, rendering it tiring and pointless to sink time into. Number 6. Uncharted – Fight for Fortune When the trilogy of Nathan Drake's Uncharted adventures wrapped up, Naughty Dog were already hard at work on a couple of additional titles for the PlayStation Vita to keep the franchise alive. One of these was Uncharted – Fight for Fortune, a harmless but ultimately shallow foray into a surprisingly different genre. Considering the series started off as an ode to action movies, seeing Uncharted find its way into a card battler is just confusing. From the heights of clambering across a moving train, firing machine guns at enemies whilst Drake yells charismatic zingers to collecting cards of his friends, enemies, and the donut drake unlockable skin. It's certainly a change of pace. A collectible card game was a unique proposition and not your average suggestion for a spin-off, but not only does it feel like a big misstep for the franchise's mission statement, it also lets down the system that it's on. The game only came to NTSC and PAL regions, and did so at the exact same time as the other PS Vita spin-off of the series, Golden Abyss. You know, the one that actually functions like you'd expect an Uncharted game to. Instead of having two great Uncharted side games, the PS Vita got one, and a very forgettable card game. Number 5. Metroid Prime Federation Force Metroid Other M is largely viewed as the game that could have killed Samus Aran's spacefaring adventure series. After releasing to critical and commercial vitriol, there were a lot of questions about the future of the franchise. Six years passed before the Metroid name was seen again, but it would be even longer before Samus returned. In 2016's Metroid Prime Federation Force, fans were delivered something that felt like it was designed as its own IP and then just had a familiar name slapped on it to sell more copies. Whilst it's perfectly fine to explore a franchise's universe and attempt to grow it by adding a new perspective, doing so after such a huge flop and then total silence for many years meant that Federation Force was understandably derided from the offset. A combination of a co-op shooter and a gimmicky soccer minigame, not only did Federation Force put players in the shoes of clunky mechs, but held very few of the core elements that drew folks to the franchise in the first place. A brand new chibi-esque art style and a lack of single player in a series that often conjures feelings of isolation and survival, Federation Force was doomed. Thanks Hopefully the 3DS remake Metroid Samus Returns a year later set the franchise back on the right path. Number 4. Metal Gear Survive When Hideo Kojima left the franchise and the now very fractured working relationship with Konami, the publisher of course wouldn't let the money-making Metal Gear series rest. In 2018, they put out the first and so far only instalment in the wake of Kojima's departure to a resounding reaction of, oh god no. The defining features of the Metal Gear franchise are all left in the past as the series jumps the shark into alternate universes and zombie infections. Metal Gear Survive scoops out the campy fun and humour and replaces it with grey and boring reuse of MGS5 assets and microtransactions. Aside from fairly generic resource hunting and base building, Metal Gear Survive's hunger and thirst systems, whilst perhaps seem right for the franchise in theory, wind up making the entire campaign's worth of fetch quests a real slog to manage. Perhaps the worst of all is Survive's story, whereas the MGS series succeeded with its convoluted political thriller narratives and roster of bizarro characters, this hard left turn is a bland adventure game that explores the most boring excuses to introduce zombies and creatures made of dust to the series. Not a single member of the cast is engaging, and it's very easy to forget that you're playing a Metal Gear game at all. Number 3. Mario & Sonic at the Olympic Games Throughout the 90s, there was really only one important choice to make as a gamer. Were you Team Sonic or Team Mario? Video game mascots were at sales war and kids the world over picked their side. When Sega stopped producing their own hardware, a partnership with Nintendo opened the door for the unthinkable, a crossover event. What exact shape that could take boggled the mind, but considering that both characters were instrumental in shaping the platforming genre, a team up to save the world seemed like something that may finally happen. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games may well be 2007's biggest gaming mistake. After years of hoping to see the pair either do battle or team up, having a title with the two heroes running down an Olympic racetrack on the cover felt cheap and hollow. Instead of marking such a massive event with a carefully curated crossover, we instead had a marketing tool for the Olympics. 
Not only was the game not what fans wanted to see from a design perspective, its quality was so-so at best, nothing more than a collection of gimmicky mini-games. It was always going to be surreal seeing the two together, but having them face off against each other in table tennis and shot put was the wrong kind of weird. Number 2. Umbrella Core Like Link's crossbow training, you can always tell that a publisher knows they're putting out a turkey that they already want to forget about if the game doesn't even have the franchise's title on it. Part of the Resident Evil series, Umbrella Core is Capcom's foray into the world of the esports shooter. Famously, Resident Evil 6 had tried to cater to as many markets as possible and wound up falling flat in the process. This 2016 follow-up to that honed in on the Call of Duty markets without making any effort to wrestle any players away from the established action shooter series with either its own gimmicks or, in fact, any ounce of quality. Umbrella Core's gameplay is shoddy, with sloppy controls, bad animation, and an unbelievably shallow depth of content. The limited maps are dull, the single-player mode is practically non-existent, and each weapon feels exactly the same as the last. Perhaps what's most infuriating about Umbrella Core is that parts of the game are canon, setting up events for Resident Evil 7, the game that gave the franchise its most recent and sorely needed refresh. Ethan Winter's soft reboot for Resi style saved the series, but not after Umbrella Core had pulled its pants down one last time. Number 1. Freshly Picked Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land the Zelda series had such an interesting array of secondary characters by 2006, all of which could have offered an exciting new twist to the formula. The princess herself had never been the star, forgetting the terrible CDI games as we all should. A turn as Ganondorf could have been truly interesting, or perhaps back onto the Hylian Seas with Tetra. But Tingle? Really? In all fairness, Tingle's design really connects with Eastern players for some reason, so the actual outright existence of this spin-off isn't all that shocking. It's Nintendo's bold choice to bring the game to the West and expect it to do more than outright flop that causes confusion. It's safe to say that not many people outside of Japan saw this on a shelf and thought, yes, this is what I'm looking for. Those who avoided Tingle like the plague didn't miss much either. The game amounts to little more than a novelty, with an RPG battle system that gets tiring and some of the most run-of-the-mill dungeons to explore. Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land released around the same time as Twilight Princess. Unsurprisingly, Zelda fans were far more interested in a mainline title returning to a more realistic art style over a Nintendo DS spin-off that offers the backstory of a whiny flamboyant man-child that many players would prefer to never see again. And that's the list! Let us know what you thought of this video in the comments below and any other video game spin-offs that you were insulted by. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe and hit that notification bell. I've been CypherWhatCulture.com and have a good week.